<laughs> it's being live streamed. Welcome to those of you who are on YouTube, whether you're with us live or if you're watching this after the fact. Very excited um, for you all to be here. Um, and I believe that concludes my uh, opening announcement. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Allison to get us started. Hi, thank you, Alana. Welcome. I am so glad to see everyone here virtually. And I wanted to mention that tonight's featured presentation presenter is Lynn Vardage McIntyre, our the Rancho's horticulturalist, who will speak about a very appropriate topic for today, summer solstice. And then following Marie's presentation, Alana and Andrina will talk about what a land acknowledgement statement is and why we have developed one. But first, a few important updates. Believe it or not, construction has finally started. And if you're in public hours tomorrow through the rest of the week, you will see that it's literally started. Um, this is for our stormwater recapture project. We will remain open. We are requesting flexibility on with path of travel for tours, et cetera, for most of the construction period. But we will be entirely closed to the public July 5th through the 15th, while the 22,000 gallon cistern is installed. So if you normally volunteer during that period with gardening or curatorial activities, please check with your staff coordinator before coming on site. Um, we are also planning, we hope, to get the actual date when the cistern goes in, because that should be a pretty big deal. We like to plan a little event around that. So we will invite everyone when we know that date is. And as I'm sure Alana can attest to, is camp signups are underway for our four week long sessions between July 18th. Note that is literally the Monday after the cistern goes in through August 13th. Space is filling fast. In fact, at least one week is already full, but we would ask your help by spreading the word to families with elementary or middle school children. What we're also excited to announce is we do have two Getty Marrow multicultural interns who are joining us this summer. We have two, we have Grace Lopez, who started a few weeks ago on uh, June 6th. She is our curatorial intern for the summer. Grace will be assisting with an exhibit on the John Temple Appeal document, among other projects. And if you don't recall, the John Temple Appeal document is a document we fortunately received from the Bixby Land Company. It's the actual document about the appeal that John Temple had to go through to prove that he owned the Rancho Los Cerritos land. This exhibit will be in the library and it should be opening in early fall, say September. And it should be a really neat exhibit to talk about not only the appeal document, but what that process looked like, how some other owners didn't get their land, but John Temple did. It should be really neat. And then we'll talk about the temple and of course then the Bixby history. <clears throat> um, Grace also is a Long Beach native who graduated from Cabrillo High School and who is starting her senior year at CSULB this fall and she is majoring in history and poli sci. Our other wonderful intern is Stara Steichen who just literally just graduated from Cal Poly SLO. In fact, I think her start date was yesterday because she literally just graduated. And she got her degree in political science and she's our education intern this summer. She will be assisting with summer camp primarily and several other projects. She is a Long Beach native who graduated from Mill Millican High School also really neat about Sarah is she is very familiar with our summer camps. She has helped out for many years, so she knows the summer camp. She knows what to expect. She knows what our little ones, elementary and middle school children act like, how to work with them. So we are super excited to have her on board as well. 
And both Sarah and Grace will be at RLC for 10 weeks, which means we get to have their help through August. And they not only be working on their project, but they will helping, they will be helping me with administration, Andrina with some grant work, Marie, of course, in the gardens with Alfred on facilities, which also is always an intriguing possibility about what they may be stripping or painting or working on. Um, but they will get a full Rancho experience. And I do hope when you see them on site, because they are here full time during the week, that you will extend our wonderful, warm Rancho welcome to both Sarah and Grace when you see them around the site. We're excited to have them here. We've got some exciting stuff going on this summer. And without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Laura, who's going to feature our key speaker. Marie. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, our feature presenter is my estimable colleague, uh, Marie Barnage Mackabal. <laughs> okay, my <laughs> tongue is all tied up, too. <clears throat> As a horticulturalist, she studies plants. That includes the plants themselves, as well as their stories, as all of you garden docents know where they come from and how they are used by diverse cultures around the globe. She's also fascinated by the mythology that surrounds plants and cultural celebrations that use plants. When we noticed the date for this program was June 21, Marie asked if she could do a program on the summer solstice, which is obviously quite timely for tonight. She's excited to share what she's learned about this annual multicultural event with all of you. Marie herself is a Southern California native. Some fun facts that you might not already know about her. Someone in her family briefly owned Rancho Bologna and someone else was a mercantilist, a contemporary of John Temple, but in Jerome, Arizona. Oh. Do you know when Marie first started working at Rancho Los Cerritos? 10 years ago? 20 years ago? No, 30 years ago in July, 19, 1992. <laughs> Just look at what she's been able to do over the past three decades. And now I will pass the mic to Marie. Good evening, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> share. Where is my slideshow? There's my slideshow. There we go. Are we good? All right. Sky watching or astronomy is the earliest natural science and allowed for tracking time and navigation. The observation of the heavens and how that corresponded with seasonal shifts were noted. With settlement, craftsmanship increased and for tools, weapons, and enhanced rituals. <clears throat> Agriculture flourishes only with good day length and when fresh water can be recharged. Knowing when to plant the seeds was critical if you were to feed the community. Archaeology and anthropology show that marking the seasonal changes known as the solstices and equinoxes was part of early humankind's development around the globe, as were the deities that each felt controlled the world around them. In ancient Babylonia, Ishtar, the goddess of fertility, love, and war, would mourn the loss of her consort, Tammuz, the god of plants and food, who dies in the summer. Because of the intense heat of the season, it came to be known as the dead season, as disease and famine were common. The solstice is marked by Ishtar's mourning in a six-day reenactment of the wake for Tammuz, <clears throat> placing his statue on a funeral byre that mourners pass, singing a dirge and wailing. In Gosek, Germany, an archaeological excavation in 2002 uncovered the remains of a circular wooden wall surrounded by a narrow ditch 
and evidence of ritual sacrifice. The gaps in the wall correspond with observation points for the winter and summer solstices and dates to the Neolithic period. And this hen now, currently this henge has been reconstructed and is now open to the public and it is possibly the largest architectural structure serving as a celestial observ observatory 2000 years before the Egyptians. In ancient Egypt, the summer solstice was heralded by the star Sirius in the Eastern sky just prior to sunrise. The star represented the goddess of fertility Isis for shortly after the star appears, the Nile River would flood. This massive inundation of fresh water was celebrated as it could be diverted into ditches for irrigation of agricultural fields. This was also considered the mark of the new year. In 2575, between 2575 and 2745, Two of the fourth dynasty great pyramids on the Giza plateau were placed so that when standing at the great sphinx, they would bracket the setting solstice sun. In 1600 BCE, the Shang dynasty developed a solar calendar. At the summer solstice, the force known as Yin focused upon celebrating the earth and femininity. Rituals included remembering ancestors, offering sacrifices, prayers of gratitude for the harvest, and asking for a productive and safe year free from natural disasters. A real concern as monsoons would arrive later that summer. Women wore peonies or pomegranate flowers in their hair and exchanged colorful fans <clears throat> um, to move the heavy air and fragrant sachets to deter mosquitoes. Regional differences include upright pole with no shadow, as well as dragon boat racing. And in fact, in some communities, the boat racing is more predominant at the summer solstice than act the actual dragon races themselves. Now, food has also played a part in the solstice in China. With hot weather coming, they look to cool the body and control the yang energy serving chilled noodles, cucumber or cabbage sal salads, bitter melon, lychees, and dog meat. The latter has come under political pressure, but is still practiced in some provinces. In 1200 to 1400 BCE, the Olmec are considered the first civilizations of Mesoamerica and created a stone calendar called the Solar Round. The cultures that followed developed complex calendars and built observatories such as Mount Alban that tracked Venus, the Pleiades, and possibly Orion. The stone-walled city of Tulum in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula is from the Mayans temple of the descending god, where a rising solstice sun strikes a small hole and the starburst of light shines through. In Bolivia, near La Paz, on the shores of Lake Titicaca, the best known structure is a three meter by four meter monolith, a freestanding arch carved from a single stone known as the Gateway of the Sun. The stone has astronomical and astrological engravings. It is theorized that the gateway was positioned to mark significant periods when the sun would pass through the opening. When Europeans found that it in the mid 19th century, it was lying on the ground with a large crack. It has been raised, but the original site is unknown. The Incas Machu Picchu, the temple of the sun is famous for its winter solstice, but it has a second window that catches the rays during the longest day of the year. Sacrifices of llamas to the deity Inti asking for good planting, growing and harvesting in the coming months. Today, a lengthy festival in June still celebrates Inti Rainy. 776 BC to 33 AD, ancient Greek calendars used the summer solstice to mark the beginning of the year. 
the festival Cronia, celebrating the Titan God's mythical golden age, where supposedly peace reigned and all were equal prior to agriculture and slavery. This was held in Attica and Athens, and while not as crazy as the Roman Saturnalia later in the year, still wild by Greek standards. Slaves were allowed to participate as equals and even have their masters serve them. It also marked the one month countdown to the Olympic games. A ritual was to light bonfires at crossroads. Communities would come together to add stuff they no longer wanted in a household purging. By eliminating and burning the clutter, they were purified, renewed, and starting fresh. A second ritual around the bonfire was to jump over the bonfire. Those successful might have their hopes and dreams come true. Today, there is an annual trek to Mount Olympus celebrating social harmony and peace. In the Book of Jubilees, the summer solstice is when Adam and Eve are exiled from Eden and the animals lost their power of speech. It also marks when the great flood featuring Noah stops. Generations later, Moses struck a rock and brought much needed water forth and the well of healing and life is reborn. However, some worried that one, he did not ask for the water but used force by striking the rock. And two, he did this during the seasonal change summer solstice, which coincides with the angels shift change. This potentially allowed demons access. To ensure all that was safe, water stored in the home was at risk and should be discarded. As water was a precious resource, this must have been a sacrifice of no small order. 625 BCE to, 7 to 476 AD in Roman Empire, the goddess Cardius is the deity of health she also protects portals, doors, hinges, or other passages. It was Cardius who could open that which was shut and shut that which was open. She was also tasked in keeping children safe from evil, spirits, and witches. The summer solstice was considered pivotal to the Romans and Cardius considered the hinge of life. June 23rd was considered the closing of the summer solstice. It is the night that anything can happen and everything can be remedied. It is the night of witches. Romans would light lanterns and torches and gather at the Basilica of St. John Lateran to pray to the saint, set off fireworks, enjoy music that would be interrupted by cowbells, whistles, and other noisemakers, eat, drink wine, and eat snails. Yes, snails. But they would also use garlic to ward off the witches who would be gathering herbs for their spells. Today, this event goes on from 7.30 to midnight from the 22nd to the 24th. The Roman influence is felt in countries and cultures far away from the city of Rome, including the term solstice, which means sun standing still. The Roman structural pantheon dates to 25 BC and was designed for Roman gods. The current structure was constructed 126 to 128 AD on the site of the original. It is a rotunda with a domed ceiling 172 feet in diameter and was the largest upon its construction. Centered in the dome is the only window a 27-foot oculus allowing light and rain into the space below. Only between noon and 1 p.m. on June 21st does the sun hit and shine down through the oculus, not straight down, but it, the resulting beam lights the front entrance. The word pantheon means all gods, and this building, rather than being dedicated to one deity, was to all gods. It was the first Roman pagan temple to be consecrated in the Christian church. Today, the church turns off its lights so the tourists who travel from all parts of the world can experience this phenomenon as the architect intended. 
As the Roman Empire spread, so did many of their rituals and customs. The tradition of bonfires were integrated to cast out evil spirits that infested communities. The need fires were a ritual to heal or to protect their livestock. Fires at home are extinguished and the animals are driven to a central location where two bonfires are started. The animals are driven between the two fires hoping to prevent disease for the coming year. After the animals are purified, the citizens dance to music around the flames, refreshing themselves as needed with alcohol and food. Then the ashes are scattered over the fields to promote growth. In the Austrian Alps, up to 10,000 fires are set into designs. The event is called the Bear Foyer, Arwalt, and is another popular tourist experience. The feat of jumping over fires was popular and that spread to Ukraine and Russia where it is known as Kupka or Ivan's Night. Once again, this uh, honors John the Baptist. Here water is also featured and floral garlands are tossed into the water and predictions are made upon their movements. In Finland, once called Uka, after a Finnish god, this too now honors John the Baptist. Bonfires at sea or lakes with dancing, feasting, and drinking ensue. Birch branches are placed on either side of the doors to welcome guests. Will-o'-wisps, a mystical light that often leads travelers astray, appear on midsummer night to finders of the fern in bloom. These are closely guarded by evil spirits, so the longest day of the year is the safest time to seek them. Now, ferns don't actually bloom, okay? Horticultural note there. And most young couples that wander into the wood seeking the fern flower are generally looking for some privacy. However, it's noted that children born nine months after the solstice are often referred to as fern flowers. In Iceland, they celebrate the midnight sun because now the lambing season is over, so the Viking community leaders will gather at Ah Thing since 930 AD, where for two weeks, within two weeks, legislation was discussed, passed, and justice dispensed. How is that for efficiency? Large crowds would gather and it became a social event. Cows gained the power of speech seals become human, stones float, and most dangerous of all were the Huda folk. These elves will try to tempt you into their world. Beware of pausing at crossroads, for they are likely to come at you from all directions. They will offer you great riches if you join them, but that way leads to madness. If you are strong enough to resist them until dawn, you might just claim the treasures they tempted you with. Today's treasure for Iceland is the Secret Solstice Music Festival. It is a four day event featuring international music, some of it in Iceland's most spectacular scenery. In Sweden, the maypoles are erected and decorated with greenery and flowers. Floral wreaths are worn on the head to sympathize to symbolize rebirth and fertility. These wreaths would then be dried, saved, and then added to the Christmas bath to encourage good health for the family until the next summer solstice. In silence, young maidens would pick seven flowers to place under their pillow to dream of their future husband. Regional food includes pickled herring, potatoes, and strawberries, typically all served with aquavit. In Norse mythology, the sun is a female goddess soul. She drives her chariot across the sky each day, pursued by the wolf's skull. She is also known as the goddess of protection, victory, and viewed as a healer. Despite all of that, she and her brother, the moon, are considered lesser gods. Yet we celebrate soul each week as her name was converted into Sunday. The end of the world, Ragnarok, is when the wolves will swallow the sun. However, at the solstice, Sol is well ahead of him. And for 10 weeks, she is at the height of her power. 
Bonfires are big in Norway, usually set along the coastline. But in the 1800s, old wooden boats were filled with debris and hauled by youth through the streets on fire. Due to the hazards this created, these boats are now anchored in the ocean before being set alight. Norway holds the record for the tallest bonfire. However, due to concerns over the environmental impact, some places are beginning to prohibit them. The open chalk plain with geologic ridges formed by glaciation happened to line up with a solstice. Once surrounded by woodland, this was an open space easily used for gathering. The earliest structure on the Salisbury Plain was probably a wooden hinge or circle of tall posts, circa 85,000 to 7,000 BCE. When the Neolithic farmers and herders built the henge, they made sure that the henge itself also lined up with the solar axis. In 3500 BCE, multiple barrows were added. The henge continued to evolve with a hundred meter circle, a ditch around the hedge. And as many as 150 individuals were interred here, making it the largest Neolithic cemetery in the British Isles. 1,000 years later, the stones were added, capped by lintels. They're held in place using mortise and tenon joints. Tongue and groove, construction connected the ends of the lintels to the next stone in line. The purpose was likely ceremonial rituals. It was not until the 1960s that it was suggested that the megalithic stones operated as an astronomical calendar, corresponding with the solstices, equinoxes, and even eclipses. All of this construction occurred 1,000 years prior to the Celts settling the area. Once the Druids settled, they considered it to be a sacred space and the solstice pilgrimages were celebrated here. <clears throat> At the summer solstice, the rising sun is just to the left of the heelstone. There is an avenue from the river Avon to the Henge and the final run of that avenue also lines up with the solar axis. Not as detailed to equinoxes as structural calendars closer to the equator, that may well have been due to the cloud cover of the region. Today, Stonehenge is a gathering point for pagans, druids, Wiccans, and tourists, especially at solstices. In fact, today you can save the airfare and watch the solstice online. Not everyone in England came to Salisbury Plains and other rituals abounded. Modest candles to bonfires were lit, once again with fire jumping. Here the, highest jump, oops, sorry. Here, the highest jump would indicate how tall the crops would grow. Wrapping a wheel in straw, setting it alight, and then rolling it down the hill, hopefully into a body of water where it could be extinguished, was a regular practice. It was expected that fire would have strengthened the sun, drive out evil, and brought fertility and prosperity. Magic abounds in the brief night, and it allows ghosts to cross into the world and mystic characters have better chance of creating mischief. So floral crowns were worn for protection. Maypoles and spiral dances where individuals would dance through the villages holding hands and winding off into the high point, twining into a tight spiral, and then unwinding the human chain to open once again. This contraction and expansion reflects the physical representation of the solstice. Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream today is often performed outdoors in outdoor venues. <clears throat> in Ireland, the Celtic Druids named the summer solstice Alban Heffen, which translates into the light of the shore. This refers to where the land water and sky all meet at the coastline. Considered an in-between place in nature and thus very important to the Druids. Solar festivals celebrated joy, love, fertility, prosperity, abundance, and good fortune. 
Flowers, herbs, music, and fire all played a part. If wood was unavailable, bale fires of straw were set alight, often on hilltops. It signaled the end of planting and early harvests. They also looked to it as a marriage between the earth and the sun. Thus, June and the summer solstice was a popular time for hand fasting or marriage. Tree worship was a tenant of their faith and the oak reigns as king of the forest from spring to autumn. And he is at his height of power during the summer. And so when he battles with holly, he will win. The beech tree is the queen of the forest. She symbolizes wisdom and it was the sacred wood of the summer solstice. If you write a wish upon a beech twig and bury it, your wish will come true as the twig decays. Hazel trees protect against evil spirits. They symbolize fertility and post-harvest. If you stir your jam with a hazel twig, it will stop the fairies from stealing it. The Celts too built monuments to mark the passage of the seasons. In County Limerick, Logur's Bronze Age Grange Stone Circle is the largest standing stone circle in Ireland. As with the others mentioned, the rising sun is framed by the entrance to the circle. In North America, in the 1000 to 1650 AD, in what is today known as Adams County, Ohio, a massive earthen lunar calendar serpent was built to align with solstices and equinoxes. The serpent measures 1,348 feet long. It's five feet high with a head of 120 feet long. The head aligns with the summer solstice sunset, while the tail coils align with the winter solstice. The medicine wheel at Big Horn Mountain in Wyoming was a sacred site before the wheel was added. At over 906,000 no, feet in elevation, it was designed for a year round celestial observation despite the harsh winter conditions. The 80 foot wheel is impressive all on its own. However, this observatory is literally only one of a series, potentially up to 150 wheels that can be found heading north into Canada. Not just one tribe, but over a dozen distinct tribes used these observatories. In Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, the village itself is constructed to align with the cycles of not only the sun, but the moon as well. Generations of astrological observations were taken into account. And then it took lifetimes between 900 to 1150 AD to build this complex of structures. One review of 49 California tribes showed that 40 observed at least one of the solstices. The earliest sign of habitation in California was found on Santa Rosa in the Ventura Channel Islands, dating 8,000 to 13,000 years ago. The Chumash people that settled and dispersed throughout the mainland utilized caves for sacred rituals. The pictographs left behind show how important the sun, moon, stars, and other astrological phenomenon were to them. We know they tracked both solstices using direct observation, meaning they literally watched the sun set or rise against the horizon or a horizon marker, perhaps between two peaks of a mountain, um, as well as indirect. And indirect is where it's the sunlight would strike a specific point such as a sun stick or a painting or other mark. Where natural windows in rock formations formed, paintings were placed so when the sun on the solstice rose or set, the image would be highlighted. Shamans would encourage the sun to take up its journey, for should it fail, they saw that the resulting cosmic imbalance would mean death for all. Some of these ceremonies were limited to the elders, while others were for the whole community. Some of these observation or observatories were shared with neighboring tribes. 
The Tongva also observed and celebrated the solstice. One potential site was a two mile stone circle recorded by the earliest Europeans to explore Catalina Island. The Spaniards wrote that it was a well cleared sacred ceremonial site with altars, burial sites and large stones with a sun god idol in the center. They believed that its main purpose was to worship the sun god. But those rocks may have been configured to align with astronomical events. To the east of their territory in the National Angeles Forest is a good sized boulder with a hole drilled into it. With a slender sun staff inserted, the shadow it casts hit the faded and degraded pictograph during the winter solstice. But there is a belief that it may have been important for both solstices. The Chumash and the Tongva were not agriculturists. Yet they too measured time, charting celestial observations, perhaps marking seasonal migration of animals and gathering as a community for spiritual rituals, honoring those that have passed on as well as of course having a grand old feast. Today, we gather not because of the solstice, but with shared interest in history. I guess I forgot to show my slides. I hope this thumbnail version of a multicultural phenomenon reflecting what humankind's careful observation of our environment is capable of. Think how many thousands of years ago this was. Tonight, should you watch the sunset at approximately 8.06, and you watch the sun sink and the stars rise. Think of all of those who have watched the heavens before us. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, I haven't I haven't seen anybody's um, any questions, but remember, please feel free to put those into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, we did have uh, Joyce wanted to wish you congrats on 30. Well, Martin and Joyce both wanted to wish you congratulations on 30 years. At <laughs> Eventually. And, <laughs> and you're getting uh, like kudos from multiple people. So uh, excellent presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I'll go check over on YouTube as well. Uh, I don't see anything. Yet. Well, that's not surprising. Marie usually leaves them stunned into silence. <laughs> it's just you covered every possible question anyone could have had already. Actually, I wound up having to cut out entire countries <laughs> because of the lack of space. <laughs> All right. Well, if you if anyone thinks of any questions, you can put them in the chat and Marie can either answer them over there or we might be able to revisit them at the very end. Um, again, more happy 30th, clapping hands, all of the, the wonderful, well done Marie's and thank yous. Um, and I do believe that I am up next um, along with Andreina. So uh, I'll pull that up. Oh, Marsha does have a question, Marie. She's asking if you can explain where you bury your wish from the beech tree. Well, Marsha, I would do the soil myself. <laughs> and, and the thing that boggles my mind is this is a twig. So you're going to have to write small. And then it doesn't come true until it breaks down. So make it a long range wish. <laughs> but yes, and you in, in the soil. All right. Thank, thank you again, Marie. Um, and then I'm going to work on pulling up the presentation that we have that Andreina and I will be sharing with you all. Here we go. Oh, sorry about that. I couldn't take off myself off mute for a second. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Andreina Juarez. I'm the development associate here at Rancho Los Cerritos. And before we get started, I do want to provide a brief background of why we um, developed the land acknowledgement. So in 2020, Rancho Los Cerritos board of directors and staff members participated in a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility training and created a standing DEIA committee 
consisting of several board members and staff, where we developed a DEIA statement with guiding principles and a policy. And in 2021, the Rancho created an official DEIA committee comprising of Rancho staff, board members, and volunteers from the community who are helping the Rancho move forward with this type of work. And one of our first discussions was uh, from the DIA committee was developing a land acknowledgement to encourage Rancho staff, board members, volunteers, and visitors to acknowledge and learn about the original people on whose lands we live, learn, and work in. And as a history museum, it is important for us to reflect upon and be mindful of how Native people are viewed and how their history is portrayed at Rancho Los Ceritos. So I am going to provide a link where we have our DEIA statement, as well as our guiding principles from our website. And there we go. And our goal is to ensure that we are living up to our DEIA statement and tying it to our mission and to our values. Thanks, Andreina. So um, since about October or sometime in the fall, Andreina and I um, created a, a smaller subgroup of the committee to work specifically on the land acknowledgement statement. So we did want to cover um, what is a land acknowledgement because it might be something that's new or fairly new to those of you who are on the call. Um, a land acknowledgement is a formal recognition that one is not the original inhabitant of the land. Um, so it's not uh, about blame, um, but it is about telling the most inclusive and accurate history possible. And kind of the key point is that we're telling that history without the erasure of indigenous people and their lived experiences. Um, so it is that statement that is that formal recognition, but it's more than a statement as well. It's a way to build trust with indigenous communities to amplify the voices and the visibility of these communities and individuals within the communities. And it's a way for ourselves personally and as an institution to um, kind of hold ourselves accountable for working towards a more inclusive and equitable future, which is part of the DEIA goals um, that Andreina shared in the chat, which you're welcome to check out on the website if you'd like to see those in more detail. All right, thank you, Alana. So why is it important to have a land acknowledgement? It is important because it allows us to be mindful on how this land came to be and recognizing that the missions and the ranchos in the 19th century, including RLC, did play a role in the colonial system that displaced indigenous communities since their land was not given away to settlers voluntarily. And um, as previously stated, like museums are public repositories of knowledge whose purpose is to uplift, educate and spark interest and conversation. And this could be an entry point or pathway for education. It may be a visitor's first time hearing a land acknowledgement or hearing about the indigenous community of this area. So it gives the rancher an opportunity to see the path for learning and respect for growth. And also provides, um, excuse me, it provides exposure and learning opportunities uh, for, for um, those who have not heard about the indigenous community of this region. And it, by stating this, we, it does contribute, it does, by not stating it could contribute to erasures people's voices and histories, which has contributed to like false narratives of how Native Americans have been perceived in today's cultural, social, and political climate. Um, so where should we and where will we eventually have a land acknowledgement? Um, this is kind of a brief overview. Um, one of the main takeaways is that the land acknowledgement will be presented in verbal and or visual means. Um, so one of the key ones will be on our website and it will be presented not just with the statement which we're about to share with you, but also with some additional context and resources. Um, but we hope to eventually have some signage on site and then also incorporate it into um, events and programs which could be sort of the where we are just the host like Rancho's Walk, Beer Fest, um, and then also where it's our own event, like lectures, fundraising, children's programs, volunteer gatherings like this. Um, it's already in our visitor center introduction video. Shout out to Marie who did the voiceover for that. Um, and other examples are in 
uh, email signatures in the newsletters that go out when we uh, provide press releases or when we do media interviews so kind of we want to infuse it into everything because we're trying to build that intentionality and make it a practice of acknowledging um, that we are not the original inhabitants. The rancho is not the original building. The, we aren't the original people. So you'll start to see it and hear it more and more as we kind of move forward in this work. All right. So this is um, the land acknowledgement statement that we've developed so far. It's Rancho Los Cerritos is located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Gabrielino Tongva people, who are the past, present, and future caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern China Islands. We honor and extend our respects to the many indigenous people who call these lands home. So uh, we have the term unceded with an asterisk because we've uh, found out that that term may be unfamiliar to many people. And so we provided the definition meaning that indigenous people never legally signed over their lands to European settlers or the government. And we chose to go with this term because through our re throughout our research, we found that not only was it commonly used, but it is the preferred term for indigenous communities um, that they prefer for us to say. And I do want to state that um, this is a living statement and it will evolve in the future as we gain new knowledge and partner with indigenous communities. Uh, and then as was briefly mentioned um, at the beginning of this uh, short presentation, um, a land acknowledgement is, it starts with that statement that Andreina just shared, but it's also much more than just a statement and there are, are actions that we'll have to follow as well. So we call that moving beyond the land acknowledgement. So that is kind of opening the door to these other things like building relationships, building trust with indigenous communities, which um, might look like inviting indigenous people, um, students, elders um, to be part of our decision making table, possibly collaborate in designing future projects, curricula, um, and then also taking the time to reflect about are any of our current behaviors causing harm to um, Native American communities? Um, and that's not just one time, that will be a continual process. And we also uh, will commit to continuing to educate ourselves on the history and current social, social issues facing indigenous communities today. Uh, so this um, statement, as Andreina said, it's a, a living statement. It, it can evolve over time and the work that we're doing can also continue to evolve as we move forward with this work again. And I believe that's the end. And I saw some more things in the chat. All right. Ah, so Kim asked, what was the thinking behind using Gabrielino first and Tongva second? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> it is a good question. <laughs> So one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is that when Andrea and I formed the subcommittee, we did um, we did a lot of research. And so my guess is that that was in uh, in other organizations, land acknowledgements. That's how it was seen. Um, but we had um, resources and presentations that were shared at previous uh, California Association of Museums conferences we'd been to, um, articles, books, documentaries, and then we also looked at any land acknowledgement statements we could find for other um, places, particularly government institutions and other museums. So I cannot remember exactly off the top of my head, but my guess is that it was probably inspired by some of that research that we did. Yeah, so when we did, um for at least uh, Los Angeles based, when we would see how the, the Tongva were referred, it was either Gabrielino Tongva or Tongva Gab Gabrielino, but that is a very, uh, it is good to have that in mind as well, how we state um, what name goes first. I think also um, there are, 
So I, I, I didn't prepare myself to talk about this, but there are multiple um, names of groups uh, that are kind of under this umbrella. And so there's the Gabrielino hyphen Tongva and the Gabrielino slash Tongva, I know. And in both of those groups, Gabrielino comes first. So I think it could have also been with that. But it's, again, something where we're hoping to be able to partner with people within this community so that we can hear what will best work mm -hmm. for the community and not just what we think is best as the Rancho or as me and Andreina. You know. um, let me check YouTube. All right. So again, if you do have more questions as we're going through, you can put them into the chat. And um, I know, I don't know if Andreina is going to stay on, but I'll be in the chat this whole time so I can try to address those. Or if it's something where we um, need to kind of check it out and do some more research, we can work on that as well. And I cannot recall now who comes after me. It is Megan, who I think has just Alana, can you do your camera? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I can. So as Allison mentioned, we do have summer camps coming up starting right after the cistern goes in. Um, so we do have the camps. We have at least one that's sold out. Uh, so if you know any elementary school students or any middle school students who might enjoy the summer camps, we would love to have them. Um, they're educational, they're engaging, they're inspired by the history, but they're, um, they are still fun. So I I like to say I try to kind of sneak the history and education in so the kids don't realize that that's kind of my goal. They're just having fun, but then they learn about cattle ranching and stuff too. Um, and then we do also have volunteer opportunities at the camps for high school students. So if you know a child at almost any age um, who you think would like to know more about camp, please feel free to um, let me know their contact information or give my contact information to them. Again, it's it's a really great opportunity um, for the high school students. And um, Sarah, who's our Getty intern, actually started, she was as uh, when she was in high school helping with camp. And so it can kind of be um, a door opening to further kind of job and internship opportunities, but it's also um, a way to kind of contribute to the community, maybe learn that you don't wanna work with kids and that's equally important. Um, but uh, the, if you have questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, and there'll be a little more information in quick notes as far as um, the, uh, during camp hours, which go until two. Uh, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the backyard will be closed to the public other than on guided tours. Um, so that information will be in quick notes so you can see those details and not have to just memorize it right now. Thank you. Uh, I'm up. I have been working on a very exciting project for quite a while now and it's coming to fruition. So I'm excited to share it with everyone. You all know that we have a new exhibit in our visitor center and it's largely based on storytelling or what others call oral histories, but I'm calling storytelling. So we have um, the Lieras and we have uh, the Lieras memories of um, Miguel Murillo, who Leslie Reese talked about in last month's virtual gathering. Well, inspired by that, we are also creating a extension of our long ago Long Beach program for third graders and after school um, participants for next year. And so I've had the great pleasure of working with uh, professional storytellers and um, uh, let's see, teachers, singers, musicians. Um, I have been uh, working with them for quite a while now. And just this week, we started filming at the Rancho. It's gonna be five modules where children learn about becoming storytellers. Five different modules. There's a professional storyteller who's doing the, that part of it. And then they learn about the Rancho stories from two, the two pictured on the left here, Paul and Thelma. They'll create, or they've already created, they're now filming Rancho stories as told by uh, 
Concepcion Coronado, uh, Manuel Liera, or as told uh, by nieces and nephews about Miguel Murillo, Uncle Mike. And so they're sharing Rancho stories that the children can learn. And they've also created Rancho songs. Uh, top center is um, Deborah, the storyteller. And again, you see Paul and Thelma. And then on the top right is our incredible film crew, uh, Robert, a videographer, and his uh, cameraman, Brian. And so I can't wait to share the videos with you, but I wanted to tell you why. Some people asked me, why are you filming for two weeks at the Rancho? Well, we are filming for two weeks. Yesterday was actually at the Rancho, as you can see. And from now on, it's at a um, green screen studio, um, green screen studio here in uh, the region. But I just wanted to share that wonderful news and I will be sharing the videos at some point in the future. All right, I think we're to the time in the evening when I will uh, we'll get to see all of you face to face. So just hold tight while we uh, promote you to uh, panelists, and then I will have my topic for us to discuss, to share. You think you've got them all that are promotable? Okay, since it's a uh, summertime, uh, let's share it, our favorite summertime memory, or if you have something exciting you're doing this summer, how about sharing that with us? So per usual, I will start. I think my favorite summertime adventure was the year that I got to go on two backpacking trips and ride my bike from Seattle home to Long Beach. So that's my favorite summer memory. How about you? So I will pass the mic on to Kim Bomowski, whose husband is a fellow lover of the wilderness. Well, I was going to say that my favorite summertime memory was uh, or activity or when I was a kid um, standing in the Colorado River eating honey on bread. Uh, but you reminded me that my favorite summer activity is when my husband goes away for 10 days backpacking. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess that just about covers it. <laughs> well, I will throw it to Lori Adams. I have to think about that summertime activity. Well, I think um, I have to go back to when I was a teenager and swimming every afternoon. My, um, as a teenager, I worked with my brother who had um, a dairy, Lone Star Dairy and a milk route. And so I'd get up in the wee hours of the morning and help him deliver milk. And then on processing days, come back and, and help with the processing. And then I go swimming. I just loved it. So that's my favorite time 
summertime memory. Very refreshing. Who would you like to pass to? Oh, oh, let's see. Uh, Nancy Phillips. I see her name down at the bottom. Yep, yep. They'll unmute in a second. Probably, maybe. Well, maybe they're having technical difficulties. If they figure it out, we'll uh, come back to them. Another choice? Want to send it to your next door neighbor here, Laura Breen? Sure, wherever Laura is. It's not the same on my screen okay. as yours. So wherever Laura is, yes. Go, Laura. There she is. Hi. Yeah, I couldn't, you know, the only thing I was reminiscing today about, um, you know, I grew up in Chicago and we didn't really have, there wasn't much air conditioning in those days. So I was thinking about how it was when you walked into like a hot store, you know, like we had like a three-story store and I would just dread it. My mother would want us to go up to the third floor and it would be so hot. And then how happy you would be when you went into it one or two stores that had air conditioning or to the movies it just seemed so nice and then we were one of the first people my mother bought a um like a portable window air conditioner and that was like hardly anybody had that it was i think she wanted to be comfortable so i'm just remembering how hot we could be in the summertime back there and it's not as hot here by any means that the cons and then sleeping in a bed and just hoping for the slightest little breeze like there'd be no breeze at all and you'd be watching that curtain hoping you'd get just a little tiny tiny breeze so that's my memory of summers in Chicago <laughs> and I'll pass it on to Tom okay um my summers um we went to Catalina a lot. My, my, my parents had a boat. So every year we'd go for two weeks uh, on the boat and uh, terrorize the island and, and go to the casino and watch movies and uh, throw uh, dirt clogs at the uh, wild boar and they'd be chasing us and um, go to the arcade and go swimming. And uh, let's see, we'd also go uh, diving for money when the white, white steamer would come in. Uh, people would throw nickels and quarters out and we'd dive down and that'd be extra money for the for the uh, uh, for the fun times that was always special as well as going to Disneyland that would be always my birthday present and um, and that's in June but we'd usually do it in August for some reason um, but uh, that was always very special to me and um, then also with what Marie was saying, uh, with a lot of the uh, summer solstice, uh, I was uh, able to get to Newgrange. And that was amazing because they reenacted uh, the summer solstice with the sun coming through and hitting that special, uh, special spot. Um, and I even have a little artifact from, from the store here. It's like right there. Oh. That's one of their, one of their uh, uh, symbols that are in the wall. So anyway, that was that kind of sums up some of my fun times in the summer, um, and I think I shall pass it on to. How about uh, Edie? Okay. Um, well, you had so many wonderful summer memories. It's like you had enough for all of us, but. <laughs> um, you're a lucky man. Um, my probably favorite memory, or yeah, favorite memory of summer, depicted by the fact that it was summer, was we lived in San Marcos, Texas. My grandparents and my mom and dad, and we lived on a, adjoining land and for some reason in the summer, we would be at the grandparents' house. And it is so hot, so, so hot there. And I remember my dad and my grandfather would, my bed would be moving. 
in the middle of the, you know, late at night, my bed would be moving. And I would open my eyes and they were carrying my bed out onto the back porch. And I would close my eyes and just pretend to be asleep until they would get me to the porch and everyone would settle in on the back porch and sleep. And then I would stare at the stars, you know? And it was like, oh, it's so much, it was still hot, but it was so much cooler than in the house. So that's probably my most, uh, it couldn't have happened any other time of the year. It's a summer thing only. And um, how do I choose somebody? Just pick anyone. Well, I don't see any. Oh, can I roll? Aha. Um, okay. How about me? How about Megan? Well, I hope I can get through it. There's a helicopter going over it. <laughs> Let's see, one of my favorite memories is going to my grandparents' cabin. I grew up in the Bay Area and they had a cabin at the Russian River. And so every summer, especially for 4th of July, we would go up there and they had a great big brick patio and it was all the sparklers that we would do on their brick patio um, for 4th of July. We'd also go inner tubing on the Russian River and that's my summer plan this summer is to go river rafting with my sister. So sort of an ode to the past, uh, but lots of fun things. All right, I'm gonna sign off and I pass it to Alana. Um, before I do mine, I'll share. We have um, Sandra is our stalwart YouTube viewer and she um, shared that her favorite summer memory um, was uh, one summer they they didn't have the money to go to a water park so her sister created an at-home water park uh, so they had water balloons and an at-home slip and slide and you know they got bruises and cuts um, but later they she bought them ice cream and watermelon so uh, a really like fun memory for the family um, and then um, when I was growing up my we both of my parents were educators. So we had like the full summer off and we would do um, family vacations. And we often went to the Southwest. So actually like Chaco Canyon, which I saw in the presentation, I was like, oh, I've been there. Um, and then, you know, more recently, other than summer camp, um, I, uh, two years ago on Thursday is when I adopted my a puppy and that's, she's my first dog. That's like my, my dog for me. And so that's, that's kind of a summer thing for me now is just uh, reminiscing. And then because I'm a millennial, I also like last year made her a little dog cake and made her wear a little party hat and stuff too. So that's my new summer thing and summer plans for uh, Thursday. Um, and then I will pass to Ina. When I was about about 11 or so, maybe up until about 15 or 16, because I didn't drive yet, we lived in Gardena, which wasn't very far from Hermosa Beach. My mother used to drop my sister and I off at the beach at about nine o'clock in the morning, give us maybe a dollar or two. And somehow we had iced tea a lot. And uh, we would spend the whole day at Hermosa Beach. We'd rent surf rafts, which are different than surfboards. And we'd be in and out of that water and we would be Burnt to a crisp when the day is over, and about five o'clock, my mother would come back and get us. So we, <laughs> we were there all day long, and it was so much fun. I just loved it. It was just a great memory. And to this day, I love to go to Hermosa Beach in the summer for that reason, at least put my feet in the water. Yeah, so it's my turn to pick, huh? How about Marie? Well, as you've heard from other memories about my family, I come from a large family and my mother would take one look at all of these kids who were staying home for the summer and she would say, outside, do not come back until five o'clock. You have to have your hands in your face washed by 5.15 for dinner. Do not come back before then. <laughs> so... Fortunately for me, when I was about six years old, we moved to the base of the Santa Susana Mountains, 
And you might say that the landscape imprinted on me because I would literally follow the creek and we actually had a sandy bottom swimming hole and there were meadows and there were mountains and I would just explore. And I would have, I would get lost and I would have to figure out how, how do I get back to where there's houses? And, and I always managed to do it. And I always managed to be most of the time on time, not always clean, but most of the time on most of the, I always managed to get back. Um, but there was the other part of me that loved books. So when you have a big family and we did have a central air conditioning when we moved to that house, but it was expensive. So we, my dad would always set it up at a pretty high level and you would just be sunburned, tired, dirty. And what I would do is we had linoleum floor in the, bed, in the bedrooms. So I would take a book and a thin blanket and I would lie on the linoleum floor and cool down the body with whatever pile of books that I had managed to acquire. Um, and so those were no homework. All you got to do is read for fun. <laughs> And we haven't heard from Joy and Haim yet. Hello, everybody. Hello. Our favorite, we both said that our favorite thing from summer is travel. Uh, one year at the end of summer, we were in Turkey for three weeks, which was absolutely wonderful. And we had to remember our trip to Great Britain where we were in England, Wales, and Scotland, and we actually visited Stonehenge, not at the solstice, <laughs> but at least we got to see Stonehenge. Um, have we heard from Marsha? Yeah, I know. No. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. Well, first, Mud Mania is always my favorite, and I really missed it. <laughs> and then um, I also like the, um, let me see how I explain it. Um, well, the National Endowment for the Arts, every summer, they had opportunities for teachers could sign up and go everywhere. And um, they were always great. And I went so many great ones. But my favorite was in 1996 summer when I got to be a part of the expedition to help dig up the Titanic. <clears throat> and I was the teacher pick from the West Coast. And that changed my life in so many ways. So I guess that's always my best summer. And my worst summer now is that we don't have the concerts that I can come in and can't be with you guys. But hopefully soon I'll be able to come back. But I hate that word soon because they keep telling me that, but they don't have a definition. But I like the fact that I can see everybody and hear everybody here. So that makes me happy on this summer day. So we um, still have okay, can somebody put up a hand because my machine will say hand. That means they want to be picked because that's how I do it with most Zooms. And then I know who it is and I can. We haven't heard from Andreina or uh, Martin and Joyce. Oh, okay. Martin and um, Joy, I'm glad you put it in about congratulations for the 30 years because I knew that answer. I was trying to figure out how to put it in the chat because I remember that. Was very, but, so Martin and Joy, go ahead, bring Joyce. Bring Joy. Okay. <laughs> Wait, is some Chris, you may not know this, but your your audio is not working right. <laughs> That's Joyce on steroids. <laughs> Alien. <laughs> Still not, still not your normal voice, Joyce. It sounds like birds, Marie. I'm muted. I think Andreina may be our last person. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, well, that provided like a good time for me to think about what was like my favorite moment during summer. And it got me thinking it was when I had just turned 18. My dad and I just decided to go to the mountains to be to be at the river. I'm not entirely sure which where it was located, but we got up super early, like around four or five in the morning. We went to a.m. p.m., got a bunch of snacks 
and then got there pretty early, like around seven or eight, and we got a pretty good spot. And we just spent there the whole day just sharing stories. And it was a nice moment because it was a time that like, you know, getting to know your dad, like having these conversations of like his youth and then just sharing spooky stories every now and then. So it was a very nice, simple, uh, memorable summer for me. And then I don't think we heard from Nancy. They're unmuted, but I don't hear anything. Okay, I think we will draw this to a close. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Marie, for that great presentation. And um, we'll see you all around. Remember, you can always sign up for gardening on Tuesdays. Garden crafts, hopefully gonna be coming uh, the beginning of July, do you think, Marie? Yes, the first Friday in July. And of course, we always need people for public hours and their story time readers and Bilingual story time on the third Saturday. So, and big news, everybody. Next month, our virtual, no, not virtual. Our gathering will be in person at the Rancho on a nice summer yeah. evening. So I'll look forward to seeing you all then and before then too. So farewell and enjoy the solstice sunset. Good night. Good night. Good night. Night, everyone. I'm gonna end the meeting for everybody. So you you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. See you all next month. <laughs> <laughs>